Joining us today is Matt Reckleboom, an ADHD positive lifestyle transformation expert. Matt not only runs his own business, but is also committed to teaching people how to enjoy their lives through his expertise on the ADHD brain and dopamine release habitual training. His work not only helps to destigmatize ADHD, but proves that all those who set their minds to it can do anything they want to. Welcome to the show, Matt. People with ADHD, are you guys freaking kidding me right now? I have seen so many people on TikTok moping around and talking about, oh, I have ADHD, so my life is just not even going to start, and I'm too scatterbrained, and blah, blah, blah. Do you guys have any idea how amazing you are? As an ADHD coach and somebody that has lived the life, I'm in my late 20s, I've been on the drugs, I have gone through this special education, I've been told that I won't make it, and guys, I made it, and I want to show you guys exactly how. You don't understand what kind of a gift that you have. Do you have any idea that the average person with ADHD thinks at four times the speed of the average human being? Four times, look it up. That is wild. Now, mind you, as a dopamine deficiency, that also means that you can get angrier faster. That means that you can get sadder faster. But that also means that you are way happier than anybody else. It also means that you can be 10 times more motivated than anybody else. I want you guys to think about it clearly. I want you to do at this. I want you to comment anything negative you've ever heard about ADHD and I will destroy it. I'm gonna teach you guys how to live in an amazing life. You have quite a big following on TikTok with 2.3 million likes and over 2.61 thousand followers. How did you get your start? My goodness, when it all got started, first of all, I had no idea that any of this was gonna go on. Um, I actually started all of this because a good friend of mine just said, hey, you, you talk so differently about ADHD, you talk so differently about mental health towards the neurodivergent mind, you should try and make some TikTok videos because uh, it's a great platform, it's upcoming. And I kind of went, I guess I'll give it a shot. And I have a little bit of a different virality story than a lot of other people where I actually went viral the same day where I joined the app. Oh. <laughs> and it, uh, it absolutely threw me off. I went to sleep with the first video I ever made at 90 views and I woke up to it in the hundreds of thousands. And I've definitely never been viral before. The most people I've ever had watch a video of mine had been like 40. Uh, so it was it was a huge moment. And um, you know I realized very, very quickly that there was something to capitalize on here and something to really talk about. So I ended up just deciding to really, really go into the content creation side of all of this. and. Uh, it ended up building just such a wonderful following. It was such an interesting journey so far. So with this video that you're mentioning, what was it about? What was the content? Um, so basically what I did inside of the video where it wasn't addressing anything in particular about the ADHD brain, the thing that I pointed out, which has a lot of controversy behind it, but the thing I pointed out was that we don't need to be sad. We don't need to be uncomfortable with our lives. There's ways to help ourselves and people with ADHD need to realize how unbelievable they are. Some of the greatest minds in the world have ADHD. And I find that with, with such a quiet culture based around it, people with ADHD really don't know how incredible they can be. And when I made that video, that was the shock that went around the internet was people hating me for saying that there's positivity behind something that's caused so much pain. And I think that's what sparked everybody's eyes to be on me in that moment. Now you started on TikTok, but what made you want to create a whole website for Journey to ADHD? So that, fantastic question. Mm -hmm. um, so when I first got started, you know, I really had no idea what to do. As anybody, there's no book on what to do when you go viral. There's no book what to do when you all of a sudden have all the eyes on you. But all I noticed was the comment section. And in the comment section of every one of my videos, everyone went, what do you mean? Where can I go? Nobody talks like this. I've never met anyone else with ADHD. I thought I was alone, was actually the number one thing that everybody in the ADHD world kind of says right now. So I decided to take it upon myself to start looking for references, looking for places to send people. And the thing that I learned very, very quickly is that there wasn't a lot. That there are very, very few websites to go on, very, very few communities to join. And the one thing that I found looking at all of them is I went, I don't think that I would join any of these either. Some of them seem too complicated, some of them seem too simple. And what I decided to do in that moment was I just I decided to say I am going to see what I can do. I, I am not a tech person. I I just have a vision and I wanted to see if I could do it. And I just started Googling and researching and figuring out how to build a website, how to build a program. And you know, it all started off with creating a resource library. Just a very, very simple way that people could get information quickly. And then from there, I decided to add a community aspect to it and a fitness aspect to it and nutrition. And then we ended up adding community events and groups. And they ended up becoming the network that we've created today that is 
it, it, people are so unbelievably receptive to the program and I, I'm unbelievably proud to this day about everything that we've done. What topics do you find resonate the most with your viewers? You know, you know, it's very interesting because with a neurodiverse brain, people need to understand it affects every moment of our lives. Where it doesn't control every moment of our lives, it has a say in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And one thing that a lot of people don't realize, especially in the ADHD world, one in six people have addictive issues with ADHD. A lot of people have issues in relationships, a lot of people have finance issues. and really when you think about it, it affects every moment of our lives. So the fact on why I haven't niched down into one specific topic is because there's so many to cover and there's so much information on all of them that we need to be able to basically be able to portray maybe in one minute videos, maybe there's going to be more coming where nobody is sure yet on where the ADHD trend is going to go. But in, in terms of how do you figure out what people want, you can literally talk about life. The way that I create my videos every single day is based on what I feel that day. Whether I am feeling any addictive, addictive tendencies based on my past, whether or not I'm going through relationship issues, whether or not I am, you know, struggling with my finances at the moment, it, it just it kind of sparks, and that's what makes me find my passion to make my videos. What is the most common ADHD hurdle that your following will bring up or ask you to make content about? Not being able to pay attention which of course an attention deficit hyper disorder, that is something that is obviously a very, very big thing. But people actually view that in a very, very different light than I believe it should be viewed as. Um, very, very interesting. It, it's been, it, it's getting proven time and time again, and it's a massive topic in the world right now in terms of you know the neurodiverse community. Um, attention deficit hyper disorder is a very horrid name for what we have because people with ADHD do not have an attention deficit. In fact, people with ADHD not only have the ability to obtain but retain more information than the average human being. We do not have hyperactivity traits. In fact, we have more impulsivity traits that with the stimulated brain makes us seem a little bit giddy at times. And truthfully speaking, I think the word disorder is very, very different for us because the way that the neurobiology world looks at ADHD right now is it's actually not a disorder, but it's more of a regulation issue of the neurochemicals inside of our brain. So when people are having issues paying attention, the one thing that they are not realizing and the one thing that a lot of us need to start learning about our brains is it's not that we can't pay attention, it's that our neurochemicals are low that are causing us to not be able to pay attention. So once we're able to regulate the brain, that actually causes you to be able to have that attention, have that motivation, feel a lot more pleasure than people would before. That's the entire premise behind the dopamine uh, neurotransmitter inside of the brain. What are some accounts that you like to follow, ADHD talk or not? So once again, it's a very, very interesting topic because right now the ADHD accounts are actually just being created. The one person that is all of our queen, I have to give her a massive shout out, is Jessica McCabe, who has started the YouTube channel, How, How to, to ADHD. ADHD. <laughs> Absolutely. She is she is unbelievable and she has sparked a lot of the creators today. Every one of us know her name and she has been the hero that all of us needed back in 2016. And nowadays, you know, you have people dominating the world, such as Katie Asaurus, Connor DeWolf, Kobe Watts, you know, all of these amazing, amazing creators out there. Here we go, here we go, here we go, now one. Nothing wrong with me, two, nothing wrong with me, three, nothing wrong with me, four, nothing wrong with me. And all of us have one, one thought in our brain right now, and that's how do we help further? How do we help? push the ADHD community into that next level. And the interesting part is not a lot of us know. Where I personally like to follow people is actually in the neurobiology world, in the habit formation world, and also in the human behavior world. A lot of those things, while not talking directly about ADHD, a lot of those things actually relate to ADHD more than a lot of the ADHD content that's out there. And I find it's very useful to be able to follow things like that. So, you know, what's interesting is a lot of people have either audio processing disorder or dyslexia as a common pairing with ADHD. So it's always good to have multiple different sources out there. Um, for me personally, I love podcasts and I also love converting books mm -hmm. into audio. Uh, for me personally, I found out a long time ago, the best way for someone like myself, who I, I am also dyslexic, um, the way that I have found that works best for my brain is actually I research while I run. I found out that wow. while, while creating constant simulation, while creating constant movement for me, I actually am able to retain information a lot better. Um, so I study for an hour a day. That, that's a rule of mine that I always try and keep on. And uh, I always try and find either a book or a podcast or something like that. And I always make sure it's an audio version and I listen to it that way. But in, in terms of where to go, I mean, heck, there, there's video, there's podcasts, there, there is, there's so many books out there. And the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that they're out there. 
Well, you actually lost a lot of weight uh, quite recently through running. Have you always been a runner or did you uh, just start a few years ago? <laughs> so that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, I actually got started running in the most ADHD fashion in the entire world. And that was that when I first started to lose a little bit of weight, I was around, I believe I was around 40 or 50 pounds down at the moment. I still had not run. I still had never run. I'd never run a race, never done anything. And I was talking to my trainer at the time because I finally, I finally bit the bullet and hired a personal trainer and it was the best decision I ever made. But when him and I were talking, we said, let's do something crazy let's start training for something and he went yeah why don't we run a marathon and i went okay. cool yeah i'm down <laughs> what's that and uh i had no idea what i was getting into no idea what was about to come i had no idea that that was a 42.2 kilometer race um and i had never run in my life never really gotten into that kind of stuff but i already said yes and to be honest it was kind of exciting because it sounded like it was gonna hurt which i know sounds a little bit silly but um that that's kind of what motivated me and we actually picked the scotia bank marathon that happens down in toronto um and we we found out very quickly it was happening in 10 weeks so wow. on top of okay. running before, <laughs> i decided to run a 42 kilometer race in with 10 weeks of training and the thing that I found very, very quickly is that, oh my God, I could do it. Mm -hmm. And while I was running that distance, I cannot tell you how many times I was currently crying while running. And you know, I went through all of these emotions, I went through all of these things, but the thing that I started realizing is I kept making the distance that I had to go. I kept mm -hmm. doing the things that I had to do. Um, and it created a confidence in me that I had never had before. And I ended up actually completing the Scotiabank Marathon in four hours and 31 minutes, which I am incredibly proud of. Um, I actually couldn't run for about a month and a half after that because it hurt and I don't recommend doing it in 10 weeks. Yeah. Um, but after that, I went, I want to keep running. And I found my passion, I found my excitement behind just such a releasing endurance-based exercise that truthfully I never found before. I was the kind of person that went, a gym is the only place to lose weight, a gym is the only place to feel something and all of a sudden being outside, being in nature, experiencing different things, it changed my life. Do you find that your running helps you with consistency? You know, it's it's more interesting than I ever thought of it because a lot of people view running as when you're tired, that's when you stop and you need to work on yourself. And the thing that a lot of people don't realize is things like marathons, for instance, you are going to be tired whether you're in tip top shape or whether or not you're just starting. You're going to be exhausted. And the consistency that I actually learned from going through these battles, going through this training, was actually the mental consistency mm -hmm. to when I felt like I was going to fail. What can I do to change this? What can I do to alter my mind at the moment? Work on the central governor of the brain, which controls our exhaustion levels. Um, and that is what it truly built a mental toughness in me that I, I can't picture being without anymore. It's made me know that I can do anything that I need to do and I can push through whatever I need to do. And it was such an amazing feeling. As an entrepreneur yourself, what are your thoughts on ADHD and entrepreneurship? Um, so, you know, I actually think that everybody with ADHD should try an entrepreneurial role at some point or another. The thing that I found and the thing that is very, very common in the ADHD world is our consistency levels get a little bit uncomfortable and we definitely have our bad days that reflect in our jobs. And the one thing that I find either talking to my clients, talking to my following, talking to so many people out there is many of us have been let go and fired from jobs that we were actually good at. Um, the thing about the entrepreneurial role that I think is an absolute blessing is the idea that sometimes we can work 14 hours a day, sometimes we can work two, but at least it's on our own pace. And I think that's what's incredible. Forbes magazine actually did an, um, they, they did an article about this a little while ago. They, they said that ADHD is the entrepreneurial superpower. And I thought that it was so neat because people with ADHD were not necessarily looking for the dollar value associated with entrepreneurship. We're actually looking for the success, the freedom that's involved in making our own decisions in a day. And you know, I will work 10 hours for $20 the same way that I'll work $10 for a thousand, 10 hours for a thousand dollars. In the ADHD community, whether to medicate or not is a controversial topic that you've made some videos on. What's your stance on the issue? So, oh my goodness, that is a heck of a good question that I hope people don't necessarily get at me for, but I want you to please understand. The question is actually never to medicate or unmedicate. It's actually to either treat or be untreated with ADHD. And I think that that is the question that a lot of us need to realize because when we talk about medicating, especially children, you know, we are not educating them anymore. And by medicating and not educating, what we're doing is we're saying, take this pill, be normal. 
and that appropriates them for a certain amount of time, but when they become legal adults, mm -hmm. when they become 18 years old, when they have to start paying for their own medication, and they have no idea why they're doing it, a lot of the times that becomes very, very difficult for them to justify continuing on to take this medication, but also as, as a, a side controversy towards it is medication is not enough. Medication is not a cure for ADHD, it's something that is an aid. And when people don't realize that, when people take medication and then when they feel symptoms of ADHD and they go, I must have to raise my dosage, I must have to take two pills instead of one, that's actually where the abuse of medication and ADHD comes from. When we understand that medication is helping us regulate something like our dopamine and serotonin levels, that's when we can realize from a holistic approach, we can also do this as well. So the question, and once again, is never medicated or unmedicated. I believe that it's either treated or untreated with ADHD. And you can be both with either a holistic lifestyle or a medicated lifestyle. Another very big topic that you produce content about is relationships. Why do you feel that this is a very important subject matter to talk about? Well, in, in the social media world, you know, they have obviously put this pressure on every one of us, whether or not we have ADHD or not, that relationships have to be about going on amazing expensive trips every single year and being perfect and loving and being exciting. But I find to a very rejection sensitive audience, um, a lot of us don't realize that we're allowed to be flawed in relationships. And what that ends up causing is when we show signs of, it, of our ADHD kind of flaring up, when we get angry over nothing, or maybe when we need a break, we're not willing to talk to our partner about it. We're not willing to communicate that because that's not what a relationship is. We should be able to get past this. I shouldn't need to be angry right now. I shouldn't need to, you know, make my partner inconvenienced. And I, I think one of the best things that I could possibly say for advice towards ADHD and relationships is a lot of us feel like we are high maintenance. And sometimes it's almost like we need to be able to accept that we're high maintenance and make sure that we pick a partner that can communicate that with us as well. I think that there's a controversy there that I don't even know if I'm necessarily communicating it correctly, but a lot of us are putting this ourselves up on this pedestal that we need to be perfect. And the fact of the matter is, in a dopamine deficient brain, we're going to have our down days. And if we don't communicate that with our partner, that creates resentment in a relationship that is causing, you know, the entire world to have, what is it, like a 40, 50% divorce rate in the US alone? You've produced a sub-series of videos called ADHD After Dark. What's your thought process behind creating this content? Well, I think the biggest thought process behind it was that nobody else is willing to talk about this. I think one of the things that I do very, very differently as a creator, as a speaker, is that I don't hold back. I'm willing to tell you about the struggles of when I was a drug addict. I'm willing to talk, talk to you about these struggles of when I had food addiction, when I went through all of the difficult times of never knowing how to help myself, nor my parents, nor my friends knew what to do. And I find that when I talk about relationships, the one thing that people consistently bring up is how does this relate back to you know, the sex area of you know, our brain? How does it affect the way that we th see things, the way that we have preferences? And the thing is, there's an answer. There's an answer. There's absolutely studies on studies that are proving the different answers that are out there for us. But I find that there's a lack of creators or even websites that are willing to add that category into there. And, you know, truthfully, I actually I actually saw the repercussions of it. I had lots of people unfollow me because I was oh, making wow. that. Content. While I had a lot of people very excited um, that I was making this, this series, um, many people said, I'm watching you for my children. I'm watching you for my partner. I don't want to see this. I don't want to know about the the infidelity issues. I don't want to know about, you know, the kink relation. I don't want to know about this kind of stuff. And while I understand that, the thing that I respond back to my followers with is I want everyone to understand every part to this. I want the relation to be there, whether we're talking about how I'm currently wearing shoes right now because it helps me stay productive, or we talk about the bedroom. Regardless, I want us to know that everything has a reason with ADHD. And I think there's, there's a certain beauty in that that needs to be talked about from all directions, whether positive or negative, light or dark. Now you're based out of Canada and although most of your content is produced for an adult viewership, you had mentioned that you'd like to be a father one day. Do you think that the school systems in Canada are ADHD friendly and how can they improve? My goodness, oh, that's that's a question. <laughs> Not just in Canada, but in the entire world right now, I believe that the way that ADHD is viewed societally needs to change. 
Mm -hmm. And as I want to be a father one day, I'm very, very excited to be. I also know that there needs to be different accommodations in the school system, different accommodations in the work environment that are able to help people with ADHD kind of thrive under their beautiful brains. Mm -hmm. You need to look at people like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, um, sports stars such as Michael Phelps, Michael Jordan, lots of Michaels. Um, <laughs> you know, Kobe Bryant, you look at Jim Carrey, Robin Williams, Will Smith, unbelievable names in the world that have ADHD. And you wonder, how many people are we actually denying the ability to be unbelievable when they are in a system that wasn't made to have them use their brain to their full advantage? So I, I personally believe that a big thing that we need to be able to change in the world is the way that information gets out there. Because right now in general, people with ADHD don't know about people with ADHD, let alone the people that don't have ADHD. I feel bad for every one of us at the moment because no one knows how to help each other. In terms of accommodation, I think that there needs to be I, the ideas behind regulating your neurochemicals in terms of taking 10 to 20 minute breaks. Science has proven time and time again how much that helps. And you'll actually find in the ADHD community, many people smoke cigarettes. And a lot of people actually don't understand the relation behind that, but it's because smoking cigarettes is, it's a very, very accepted in society reason to take a 10 minute break. And a lot of people don't realize how much that's actually helping us from a neurochemical standpoint. Many people with ADHD have childhood trauma from social aspects to academics, etc. What are some things that you will pass on to your children one day to help prevent some of this? I want them to know that it's okay to not be perfect. In, in the neurodiverse community, whether we're talking autism, Asperger's, ADHD, the one thing that's very, very common is the development of something called rejection sensitivity dysphoria. And there is a lot of information out there that is showing that the neurodiverse community hears a negative comment. They actually hear seven negative comments for every negative comment a average neurotypical person will hear. And that ends up developing something called, again, rejection sensitivity dysphoria. This makes it that we actually develop a certain amount of perfectionism to us, where if I cannot come complete 100% of this task, or if I'm not absolutely perfect at it, I shouldn't even try because I'm terrible, I'm uncomfortable, and everyone's been telling me my whole life how wrong I am. I think the, the acceptance of your own brain, the acceptance of your own flaws, are the things that I, I believe absolutely need to be out there in the world. Now, a very influential movie that you've credited in the past is Yes Men, which stars Jim Carrey, who is also diagnosed with ADHD. Can you tell me how this film impacted you? My goodness, so once again, due to the perfectionism mindset that we can get into, due to the ideas of the overthinking mind that ADHD brains definitely have, a lot of us actually find that we don't like to go outside of our comfort zone. We don't like to see new things, we don't like to feel new things. Um, and the one thing that Yes Man really impacted me in is the idea that Jim Carrey was that exact person. You know, do, do you wanna help me with this? No, I don't. Do you wanna come and do this after work? No, I don't. And he was a miserable person and he had a lot of negative self-talk, a lot of self-doubt where when he eventually got the dare, he got the dare to say yes to everything for a week. And all of a sudden somebody goes up to him and goes, can you help me move this week? And he goes, yeah. And then someone comes up to him and goes, would you like to learn Japanese in under a week? And he goes, yep. And what he ended up finding was he actually loved learning Japanese. He, he made a new friend by helping somebody move. He had all of these things happen to him that ended up actually creating that optimism, that better life for him, where I actually don't believe that this is necessarily an ADHD trait that should be taken from all of this, but really it, it's a positive self-talk thing that I believe everyone in the world needs to start doing. The more that we say yes, the more that we realize how beautiful the world is. Social media makes it dictate that it, un, unless you're traveling and you're gorgeous and, and you make a lot of money, then you don't have a good life. So the amount of us, the 99% of us that don't have those things, we're looking at ourselves like I'm wrong, I'm disrupted in life. When in reality, life is gorgeous. And you know the fact of the matter is you could do one new thing every single day until the day that you pass from this earth and you will actually run out, or sorry, you will actually pass away before you run out of things that you can do on this earth because that's how many beautiful, amazing things are a part of this. And I believe that positive self-talk has to be involved in the neurodiverse brain, but especially just the, the human brain. Lifestyle is a common theme in your content, even ending some of your videos with, think about it, it could change your life. Why do you feel that lifestyle correlates so strongly with ADHD success? 
Uh, oh, again, another fantastic question. <laughs> I know I keep saying that. Um, so lifestyle is very, very important to the ADHD brain because where we are very dopamine seeking human beings. And it, for those of you that don't know, dopamine is the craziest chemical in your entire brain. It's the only chemical that actually has the ability to control what we're thinking about, how we're thinking about it, and our morality of what is right or wrong towards that subject. To talk about the severity of why we need dopamine, we need to understand that this is the sole chemical that is controlling our, our concentration our motivation and our pleasure and when we don't have this chemical which is something that is very very common amongst people with ADHD we don't feel concentrated we don't feel pleasure and we don't feel the same amount of motivation so obviously regardless of us as human beings our brain wants that chemical inside of us and once again just to reiterate the point it can control what we're thinking about how we're thinking about it and our morality of what is right or wrong so Tom Bilyeu from the host of Impact Theory actually said it best when he says that if you don't go searching for your neurochemicals, your brain will find them for you. And I believe that this is what leads to a lot of us to the food addiction, the drug addiction, um, the, the worse lifestyles that are based around TV, video games, um, and overeating. That happens to a lot of us because we find our satisfaction. TV, video games, eating, drugs, nicotine, alcohol, all of these things have one massive thing in common and that's that they give a lot of dopamine. So when we don't have a certain lifestyle in place that's giving us these things through you know, certain healthy foods, uh, proper exercise, proper habit formation, the problem is we're going to find it on the easier side. And I believe that that's why the lifestyle is so incredibly important. On the topic of lifestyle, you love to feature your dogs Maui and Marshall on your Instagram page. Why did you decide to get them? I know you have some allergies, so it must have been a, a good reason. You know, so first of all, Marshall is the family dog. He's not my dog, um, but Maui is my dog. I love him to death and he's my best friend in the world. My best friend in the world might make me sneeze, but he also makes me incredibly happy. And I actually did a video on this a little while ago as to there are certain pets that people with ADHD actually should have in their lives, certain ones that actually we shouldn't as well, which is quite interesting. Um, but the one thing that I found growing up with cats, growing up, uh, growing up just never having a dog was I always heard that dogs were great companions. Dogs were great friends. And though a very, very big commonality amongst people with ADHD is a lot of us feel very alone. A lot of us don't know who we can trust, who we can be ourselves around. And my dog, more than anything, if you ever watch my Instagram for even a day, you look at any of the posts that I do, you'll see that I'm at my goofiest when I am with my best friend. I, I am so happy because he's not judging me. He is doing things that are happy for me. He's excited every day when I get home, whether I'm in a good mood or a bad mood. And I find that you know, while, while he makes me sneeze, um, it's worth it to me because he gives me a certain, kind of, a certain kind of wholesome feeling that I don't know if I've ever experienced before having a dog. Dopamine menus have been popularized in the last few years. What's on yours? Oh, goodness. Uh, you, you know, that, uh, that actually can change based on the day, based on the feelings that we get into. The thing that I always like to talk about when it comes to the dopamine menu, especially when it comes to habit formation, is it's not about the habit you complete, it's about the fact that you completed a habit. Mm -hmm. And when we think about that, that can now create dopamine in many ways, shapes, and forms that makes it that we don't necessarily need a completely steady routine. Instead, we're almost chasing a feeling. Mm -hmm. And when we decide on it chasing a feeling, that can change whether or not one day if I want to sing and dance for two hours, like I'll be completely honest, I did before jumping on here with you. Um, you know, there are some days when I just want to clean the entire house top to bottom. There are some days when I want to go and exercise. There are some days when I just want to go for a walk and be in the now and be mindful. Um, at the end of the day, the thing that I, I think is is the most important thing is that you chase the feeling. It's not necessarily about what you complete. Once again, it's the fact that you complete something. Do you have any future projects in the works and what is next for you? The next steps that I would like to get into is I'd like to be on stage in front of every school in North America, every school in the world. I want to tell children out there that are nervous, that are scared, that don't have parents to talk to, that don't have friends to talk to, that don't know how to talk about this kind of stuff, that they have the ability to talk about it and that they have the right to talk about that and to learn about their information. The future for me vastly goes around the journey to ADHD community and the network that we've created with it. I want to create the one-stop shop mm -hmm. for ADHD and truthfully, I've done it already. And I'm really looking forward to how much further that we could build something as amazing as this program that really, I even when I look at it, I'm like, damn, who made this? Uh, <laughs> humble brag. Um, but the whole well, it's very well made. It looks very, very nice. It's very so uh, user-friendly. 
Thank you so much. And inside of the Journey Network, the whole idea that we're trying to get into is we want to have the virtual version of a community center. I want, if you have ADHD, you need to join Journey to ADHD because this is where you're going to find the tools, the community, and the, the, the diaries, the place to talk, everything that you could possibly need to learn about ADHD, to express how you feel with your ADHD, and to find others like you with ADHD. I want that to be in one spot. When we think about overthinking, when we think about the uncomfortable feelings behind being alone out in this world, we need to understand that it's roughly hypothesized that 10% of the world has ADHD, which means you ain't alone. And you need to be able to look for that. And to create a program that has everything in one spot, I think will change everything for a, a mind that craves simplicity. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. If you'd like to learn more about Matt and his company, visit journey2adhd.com. Thank you so much, Julia. It's been awesome being here. Thanks. And thank you to the viewers at home for tuning in. This has been your host, Julia Cosby, and you're watching Tag TV. Like, subscribe, and turn on the bell notifications to stay up to date on all of our latest content. <laughs>